some among them were potentially dangerous. Most were loyal. But no one knew what would happen among this concentrated population if Japanese forces should try to invade our shores. Military authorities therefore determined that all of them, citizens and aliens alike, would have to move. This picture tells how the mass migration was accomplished. Evacuation. More than 100,000 men, women, and children, all of Japanese ancestry, removed from their homes in the Pacific Coast state to wartime communities established in out-of-the-way places. Their evacuation did not imply individual disloyalty, but was ordered to reduce a military hazard at a time when danger of invasion was great. Two-thirds of the evacuees are American citizens by right of birth. The rest are their Japanese-born parents and grandparents. They are not under suspicion. They are not prisoners. They are not internees. They are merely dislocated people the unwounded casualties of war. The relocation centers are supervised by the War Relocation Authority, which assumed responsibility for the people after they had been evacuated and cared for temporarily by the Army. A relocation center, housing from seven to 18,000 people, the entire community bounded by a wire fence and guarded by military police, symbols of the military nature of the evacuation. Each family, upon arrival at a relocation center, was assigned to a single room compartment, about 20 by 25 feet. Barren, unattractive. A stove, a light bulb, cots, mattresses, and blankets. Those were the things provided by the government. In 1942, the United States government forcibly relocated over 112,000 Japanese nationals and Japanese Americans to remote housing facilities called war relocation camps for the purpose of detainment, re-education, and forced labor. Of those interned, 62% were United States citizens. President Franklin Roosevelt authorized the internment with Executive Order 9066 allowing military commanders to designate military areas as exclusion zones. This power was then used to declare the entire Pacific coast as an exclusion zone, forbidding people of Japanese descent to live within these areas, unless, of course, they were held in war relocation camps. In 1944, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of these exclusion zones, and in 1945, after two and a half long years of imprisonment, the interns were finally released. The United States government issued no formal apologies, but did present each former inmate with exactly $25 in cash and a train ticket home, if they were lucky enough to still have one. Forty-three years later, in 1988, President Ronald Reagan would sign a bill that formally apologized for the internment of Japanese Americans on behalf of the United States government, and finally granted reparations to survivors. The language of the bill stated that government actions of the 1940s internments were based upon three criteria, racial prejudice, wartime hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. So what is most important in this bill has less to do with property than with honor. For here, we admit a wrong. Here, we reaffirm our commitment as a nation to equal justice under the law. In 2001, following the attacks of September the 11th, our government again went into open roundup mode, detaining and imprisoning thousands of United States citizens again seemingly based upon the same three criteria used to intern Japanese Americans. Race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. Let there be no argument. The United States government has put its own citizens in detention centers. The justifications for doing so range from personal prejudices based upon political and religious grounds to wartime frenzies and fears of future terrorist attacks. In a time of great crisis, the impossible becomes possible. Is it possible that internment camps are being built in the United States today? Is it possible that history will repeat itself? Obama 
claim the power to keep people in prison indefinitely with no charges against them, no conviction, no sentence, just imprisonment. Well, we used internment camps here in the United States during World War II, uh, and we interned Japanese Americans, uh, or Americans, I should say, to be more correct, uh, Americans of Japanese descent. And these people were cordoned off for the duration of the war. Uh, background checks could have been done. They could have been released or cleared out of those facilities. Uh, but it was thought best because there was so much animosity toward the Japanese for the attack on Pearl Harbor and subsequent deaths of U.S. soldiers that these people just be kept uh, uh, out of sight in one of their detention facilities. On April 1st, 1979, by Presidential Executive Order 12127, the Federal Emergency Management Agency was created for the purpose of coordinating the response to disasters that have occurred in the United States and that overwhelm the resources of local and state authorities. Upon its creation, FEMA absorbed the Federal Insurance Administration, the National Fire Prevention and Control Administration, the National Weather Service Community Preparedness Program, as well as several other federal level preparedness programs. FEMA was also given the responsibility for overseeing the United States Civil Defense, a function which had previously been performed by the DOD's Defense Civil Preparedness Agency. In 2003, FEMA became part of the Department of Homeland Security's Emergency Preparedness and Response Directorate. FEMA follows three simple directives. One, national emergency recovery, two, continuity of government, and three, combating perceived threats to the existing social and political order. FEMA's implicit objective to provide aid to victims of disasters changed under the leadership of President George W. Bush. Although some may argue, prior to the Bush administration, FEMA's reaction time for responding to and the handling of national emergencies was beginning to improve. But in 2003, President Bush would shift the focus of responding to emergencies in America by placing FEMA under the umbrella of the Department of Homeland Security, whose stated objective was and still is to protect our nation from dangerous people. Did the Bush administration's war on terror mentality take priority over the government's emergency response to provide aid to victims during a national disaster? We're fighting evil. And I remember my first words to him were, Mr. President, my estimate is that 90%, 90% of the population of New Orleans has now been displaced. 90%? Yes, sir, I believe it is that bad. That's how bad it is. I really thought that would get just the whole mechanism of the federal government to come charging in. Is once again this mentality that it's a natural disaster. It's a hurricane. It's not Al-Qaeda. The most important job of government is to protect the homeland. In the midst of a searing heat wave, Jefferson County residents lined up in their cars for food and water, wondering what took so long. Slow, slow. Everything is slow. The man who runs the county, Judge Carl Griffith, agrees. And in a meeting with President Bush this morning, said FEMA's delivery of relief supplies was unacceptably slow. To save American lives, we must be able to act fast. To real distrust of the federal government, especially with the levy system, because now the Army Corps has pushed that date back now to 2011. It was supposed to be up by 2010. As requests for emergency assistance poured in after Hurricane Katrina, one applicant listed this as his address. The Greenwood Cemetery in New Orleans, FEMA, promptly issued a check for $2,358 for rental assistance. 
That's just one of thousands of examples of alleged fraud and abuse described in a new report by the investigative arm of Congress, cost to taxpayers about $1 billion. The examples are so egregious that what they tell us is that FEMA didn't perform even basic checks to safeguard taxpayers' money. Well, today the outrage spread to Congress where House members accused FEMA of a cover-up. Two years after Katrina, 76,000 FEMA trailers are still being used to house families who lost their homes. Many of the trailers have high levels of formaldehyde, which can result in dangerous respiratory problems. Three of my children began having severe nosebleeds several times a week. Uh, it got so bad that this past Tuesday I actually had to go to the emergency room. Several deaths may well be linked to toxic levels of formaldehyde gas. It is a sick organization. Uh, and it has totally lost the confidence of the people of America. Overnight, FEMA decided to stop issuing debit cards at Houston shelters, but almost no one there hoping for a card had any idea. Piled everybody up in a van and come up here and we can't even get what they said we was going to get. Even Houston's relief coordinators told FEMA a heads up would have been helpful. We just were make sure everyone understood that every time they change their mind in Washington, D.C., it affects people here that are trying to deal with tens of thousands of people. We're talking about damage from Hurricane Rita last year, two devastated schools and kids and parents waiting for help. A few months ago, the folks at FEMA told the schools, one in Iberia Parish and one in Vermilion Parish in Louisiana, that they would get millions to relocate to higher ground. FEMA even helped them draw up the plan. And then FEMA took it back. Endless delays, he says, caused by FEMA, which just last week delayed money for rebuilding yet again. They're more worried about their own positions in FEMA, their own salaries, than, than the recovery process down here. There is a new hitch to report about those infamous FEMA trailers. After spending nearly $3 billion taxpayer dollars to buy them, it turned out many went unused, and now FEMA is unloading them at bargain basement prices while other people need them. After a lengthy investigation, the congressional architects of the Department of Homeland Security concluded today that FEMA, the agency that is supposed to respond to hurricanes and national disasters, should be taken out of the mammoth Homeland Security bureaucracy disbanded then put back together in a better way and placed under direct control of the president during emergencies. A Senate report on the government's response to Hurricane Katrina says FEMA is so far beyond repair that the agency should be scrapped. It said that agency failed in its view to anticipate and then respond to Katrina. FEMA is discredited, demoralized and dysfunctional. FEMA is discredited demoralized and dysfunctional. In the mid-1970s, the discredited federal government was more scared of the public than ever, coming off the years of Richard Nixon. And so two cold warriors inside the White House of Gerald Ford uh, begin to bring back some of the Cold War ideas of an executive takeover uh, of the United States through a uh, emergency federal agency. And those individuals were Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney. And so really what we see being set up by Jimmy Carter in 1979 is just a continuation of federal policy to expand uh, a federal takeover plan for continuity of government. And so that's what the Federal Emergency Management Agency uh, was really set up for. Colonel North, in your work at the uh, NSC, were you not assigned at one time to work on plans for the continuity of government in the event of a major disaster? Mr. Chairman. I believe that question touches upon a highly sensitive and classified area. So may I request that you not touch upon that, sir? One of the programs that got exposed during Iran-Contra was Rex 84. And Congressman Jack Brooks 
in those hearings brought up the fact that uh, in reality, FEMA was a cover for a huge continuity of government program in case the American people ever rebelled. And that was the architecture of the blueprint uh, for the illegitimate shadow government to fully take over the functions of the entire federal government, suspend the Constitution, suspend the Bill of Rights, and arrest whoever they wanted to. And uh, FEMA was going to uh, control the camps that the people were going to be put into. And FEMA would be the main governmental institution uh, with different directors over every agency. And now when you watch FEMA on television, it's always a colonel or a general or an admiral in uniform who's over the different departments. The martial law portions of Rex 84 were outlined in a 1982 memo written by FEMA Deputy John Brinkerhoff. Martial law was to be declared in the event of a national crisis, yet the plan did not define the term national crisis. The plan allowed FEMA to take control of both federal and state governments, appointing military commanders to replace duly elected officials. The plan also called for the rounding up of at least 21 million American Negroes for delivery to numerous military bases converted into prison centers, also known as FEMA relocation camps. Why? Because at that time, African Americans were classified as one of the largest threats to the continuity of the federal government. Who does the federal government consider the biggest threat these days? The convergence of globalization and technology has created a new brand of terrorism. There were persons who, for whatever reason, came to view their home country as the enemy. The kind of right-wing, religious-based domestic terrorism. Disturbing news tonight about homegrown terror. Part of this is a big change in the White House, a new cultural experience, and some of the crazies are coming out of their closet. Right now, it looks like there is no connection between the men arrested and any known terrorist cell. Homegrown. Uh, yeah, homegrown, I should say. Uh, folks, we've got a very serious situation here. I'm holding what is called the right-wing extremism, current economic and political climate, fueling resurgence and radicalization and recruitment. And in it, we talked about the fact that they define pro-lifers as domestic terrorists. They put this in a Department of Homeland Security uh, document, this official assessment, now saying pro-lifers, people that believe in end-time prophecies, people that uh, are opposed to the administration's position on immigration, uh, those of us that are standing up for the sanctity of life and for the sanctity of marriage, all of those are now potential, and this is what they're saying, domestic terrorists. It's a terrorist next door that could be our bigger threat. They call people who believe in the sanctity of life, who believe in owning firearms, who believe in serving their country in the military and coming back, who are very concerned about the policies that this nation is embarking on, spending too much money, taxing too much. It's all listed right here. These are the domestic right-wing extremists. One million names under the watchful eye of the United States. America's so-called terrorist watch list has hit the net record number, according to one of the country's most prominent civil liberties groups. That's a lot of people to keep track of. They're adding new people all the time. It's a secret list that you don't know really quite how one gets on, and you don't know how you get off. coming out and profiling huge groups of people, you know, if you voted for a certain political candidate, you should be considered a potential threat. And you couple that with things like the Patriot Act, where if you are a threat in their eyes, you can be held without access to judge, jury, and, and without access to a lawyer or even to your family. That's very concerning because we, we've watched our country go through and do this to brown people, you know, overseas. They're rounding up enemy combatants and they're putting them in camps and they are torturing them. That is a fact. We know that. In May 2007, President Bush signed a National Security Presidential Directive 51. The unclassified portion of NSPD 51 states that in the event of catastrophic emergency, a cooperative effort among the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of the federal government, coordinated by the president, will replace normal governmental procedure. Most Americans would agree that it would be prudent to have a plan to provide for the continuity of government. They have such a plan. They introduced a little sketchy public version that's clearly inadequate uh, and, and doesn't really tell us what they have in mind. 
But they said, don't worry, there's a detailed classified version. But now they've denied the entire Homeland Security Committee of the United States House of Representatives access to their so-called detailed plan to provide for continuity of government. They say, trust us. Trust us. George W. Bush or Barack H. Obama, it, the corruption, the tyranny just expands like PDD 51, where the president says, Congress, you have no authority over any way the government runs ever again during an emergency. The presidency runs everything. You are literally titular. You are a figurehead. You are ceremonial. And congressmen, then on the Homeland Security Committee, as high a level clearance as the president, said, we want to see the entire PDD 51. And the White House says, no, you don't get to see it because PDD 51 removes you from that process. This is high treason against the people. It is high treason to have the executive telling the Congress, you can't see Presidential Decision Directive 51. You can't see its accompanying executive order. You don't have any authority over anything anymore. FEMA is dysfunctional. This is high treason against the people. The FBI's counterintelligence program was a series of covert and often illegal programs conducted by the United States government and aimed squarely at investigating and disrupting dissident political organizations within the United States. According to a Senate Select Committee study chaired by Senator Frank Church and including such members as Phil Hart, Walter Mondale, and Barry Goldwater, the FBI's motivation for conducting these programs was protecting national security, preventing violence, and maintaining the existing social and political order. Targets included the Black Panther Party, the Ku Klux Klan, communist and socialist organizations, as well as non-violent civil rights organizations, anti-war groups, and a broad range of organizations lumped together under the title New Left, which included groups labeled for intensified attention, such as the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and Congress of Racial Equality. Over the course of four presidential administrations, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover ordered FBI agents to expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, or otherwise neutralize the activities of these movements and their leaders. Speakers, teachers, and writers, even individual student demonstrators with no group affiliation, were all fair game. Individual case studies revealed that the FBI was successful in preventing the distribution of books, newspapers, and periodicals. They prevented groups from forming and disrupted peaceful demonstrations and large anti-war marches, as well as denied groups and organizations facilities to hold meetings and conferences. According to attorney Brian Glick in his book War at Home, the FBI used four main methods for their counterintelligence program. Number one, infiltration. Getting agents on the inside in order to undermine trust and scare off potential supporters. Number two, psychological warfare. Planting false media stories, forging correspondence, making anonymous phone calls, spreading misinformation about meetings and events setting up pseudo-movement groups run by government agents, and manipulating and threatening parents, employers, landlords, school officials, and others to cause trouble for activists. Number three, harassment through the legal system. The FBI and police abused the legal system to harass dissidents and make them appear to be criminals. Officers of the law gave perjured testimony and presented fabricated evidence as a pretext for false arrest and wrongful imprisonment. They also discriminatorily enforced tax laws and other government regulations. Number four, extralegal force and violence. The FBI and police threatened, instigated, 
and themselves conducted break-ins, vandalism, assaults, and beatings, all in the name of maintaining the existing social and political order. Increased security for four New Jersey Supreme Court justices after their home addresses were revealed in a webcast by a self-proclaimed white supremacist. Welcome to the Hal Turner Show. Doesn't a noose symbolize hate, bigotry, division? Justice. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hola, this is Pedro. Spick, from don't San call. Diego. Don't call my radio show anymore, you filthy spick animal. People were being profiled and stopped if they had certain kind of bumper sticks, uh, stickers on their car, like a Ron Paul bumper sticker or a Chuck Baldwin supporter. And as you read the Make Report, uh, bits and pieces of that were lifted right out of the uh, Project Megiddo report back in 1999 by the FBI, describing what terrorists were, how law enforcement could identify potential terrorists. And I can remember uh, back in the 90s, the FBI was doing a, uh, an education program with local law enforcement, and what they had was a trifold pamphlet. Again, this was not meant for public consumption, only to be passed around uh, amongst the rank and file and the police. It ran through the list of what a potential terrorist might be or what they might prescribe to. And uh, the list is kind of interesting. If you were a supporter of the Constitution, uh, if you're an ardent supporter of the Second Amendment, or even if you were a person of deep religious conviction, you might be a member of a, of a certain cult. And going back to Project Megiddo, it's all basically the same thing. That if you have any strong beliefs in anything, that you could be a possible threat, you could be a terrorist threat against government structure. In Missouri, a new document meant to help Missouri law enforcement agencies identify militia members or domestic terrorists has drawn criticism. The February 20 report called the Modern Militia Movement mentions such red flags as political bumper stickers for third-party candidates such as Ron Paul, who ran for president, talk of conspiracy theories such as the plan for a superhighway linking Canada to Mexico, and possession of subversive literature. So the, the state police in Missouri have been told that if you see a car with a bumper sticker that opposes the so-called creation of North American Union, the silver superhighway, that you are probably following a militia member, that you are following an anti-government radical. If you see a car with a bumper sticker that says Ron Paul for president, you might be dealing with a violent radical exercise extreme caution. We do know that 28% of their funding comes from the Department of Homeland Security. This is not the first time that a report has been issued to Missouri law enforcement and surrounding fusion centers in other states by the MIAC Center. This right here is a stack of every single one of the MIAC reports that has been drafted. MIAC Alert, Constitution Rangers. June 7th, 2007. You've got the Black Separatism Bulletin. November 4th, 2008, American Radical Islam Converts. 
Here is the MIAC strategic report dated 11 28 2008 on the anarchist movement. You've got it on the modern committees of safety, voice of the people, or militias in disguise. That's January 9, 2009, which came out right before the infamous MIAC strategic report on the modern militia movement. So they've been producing these documents for quite some time. If the people profiled in this document could be considered a potential threat to law enforcement. That means they could be considered a potential domestic terrorist. And if you have the word terrorist attached to your name, whether it is domestic or foreign, the Patriot Act still applies to you, whether you're an American citizen or not. I remind you that before the Nazis began to uh, persecute and, and uh, incarcerate and, and kill and so forth uh, the Jewish people in Germany the first thing they did was label them as extremists and fanatics and all these kind of things and get the people conditioned against them and then uh, with the approbation of the general populace they were able to unleash the fury of the state against them and we all of course know what happened as a result of that Is that the face of a terrorist that they have to know where that cash came from? Again, it's turning more into fascism. It's one thing for them to make sure you don't have a gun or a bomb in your pocket. It's another thing for them to not like a book. Uh, you know, this uh, shows you the danger of profiling. Maybe uh, he was profiled because he had, uh, had a Ron Paul bumper sticker. An anti-tax demonstration is scheduled for downtown's Keener Plaza April 15th. But charges are flying that one of the organizing groups is an extremist anti-government group. The Southern Poverty Law Center and the Anti-Defamation League have their own opinions about the Constitution Party. I think we'd consider it a, a fringe right-wing political party uh, that we consider to have extremist roots. When we talk about the New World Order, it is um, mimicking, if not um, duplicating, uh, language that comes out of organized white supremacy. The elites have said that they want to have a final revolution, that they know the public's going to revolt against them, so that's why they've scientifically set up the surveillance grid, the cashless society. This whole continuity of government system is designed to suppress and control the people of America. Northcom, the Pentagon, the military are all announcing their number one job now is fighting the American people. They're saying the number one terror threat is veterans and gun owners and conservatives and libertarians and Ron Paul supporters. And I've been sent secret army documents, we call the phone numbers and they're accurate and real, where I'm being watched at In the Fed protest, where we peacefully go out and demonstrate. And now even the ACLU has written letters saying, why is the Pentagon watching U.S. citizens? Why are you listing any protest as an act of terrorism? The real terrorists are the people that have hijacked our nation that would dare say the First Amendment is terrorism. Two new reports out document an alarming rise in the number of hate groups in the United States. The Southern Poverty Law Center's intelligence report found 926 active hate groups in the country. That's up more than 50 percent from just 2,000. Morris Dees is the founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center. He joins us from Montgomery, Alabama. Good morning, sir. Your report dovetails with a brand new uh, report from the Department of Homeland Security claiming basically the same thing. And they say part of it is because of the election of President Obama. Other part of the responsibility goes to the deteriorating economy. Uh, political climate, the election of Obama, the uh, immigration issues that have faced the United States over the last five to ten years, and, and now especially the economy, is almost causing a resurgence of what we saw in the days of Timothy McVeigh, almost a, a militia uh, movement that's being uh, reborn in the United States. Homeland Security says people who oppose abortion or worry about the threat of illegal aliens 
could pose a radical threat to America. It warns about groups and individuals dedicated to single issues like abortion, immigration, and gun rights, and even raises a red flag about veterans returning home from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Does this report seem to lump in ordinary Americans who have real concerns about stuff? with nutjob racists and anti-Semites. Uh, there's one thing that's glaringly missing here, no discussion about the real terrorists, uh, the Al-Qaeda cell groups and others that are located inside the United it's States. It's all about domestic. It's the most, it's, it's, it's yeah, the most it, dangerous. It, it literally changes the entire focus for the Department of Homeland Correct. Security has been doing. I was passed by an Oklahoma City police officer vehicle. And they slowed down, got in behind me, followed me for about three miles and then uh, pulled me over. When the officers approached my vehicle, um, they asked me if I knew why I was being pulled over, and I said, no, I had no idea, and they said, it's because of the sign in the back of your truck, and I said, my sign that says abort Obama, not the unborn, and the officers um, said, yes, that's why. Later that afternoon, I got a call from the Secret Service. Uh, they wanted to uh, do a quick walkthrough of my house to make sure I wasn't some kind of radical racist. Why would Americans, under the guise and the threat of worldwide terrorism, why would they willingly give up or relinquish their rights to government when the rights, our rights did not come from government in the first place? Our rights merely came from God. They were enumerated by the government, put in the Bill of Rights, as a reminder not to us, uh, but to uh, those in power as to not violate them. And I know the history of government, not just American government, but the history of government well enough to know that most governments acquire power and they do not like dissent. We, have, we are losing our freedoms in the United States. Uh, most Americans do not realize that we have free speech zones in the United States. I mean, talk about an oxymoron. You know, all of the 50 states are a free speech zone. You're an American. That, that, by definition, creates a free speech zone. We have freedom of speech because we stand up and say what we think, not because the Founding Fathers ratified the First Amendment in 1791. So if we're losing the free speech zones, the governments in general throughout history have tried to quell dissent by controlling the media, which we already have in this country, and by generating fear of confrontation. After Seattle, the feds said, we can't allow protests anymore in America. It's too dangerous. That's why we're going to have free speech zones miles away from where the events are in baseball fields, in church parking lots, where nobody can see you or hear you. You've got your First Amendment, but you've got it way over here miles away. That all started as a beta test in Seattle in 99 with the police, after they'd staged the riots, with hired anarchists, coming up to people saying nowhere in the city could they even wear a pin saying no WTO. And the police say, hey, First Amendment is suspended in Seattle and the news pushed it like it was a good idea and the right thing to do. And the lines are open. This is first word, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, at 877-367-2526. Uh, uh, whatever's in your head, call and share it at this moment. Hello. Yeah, how you doing, Alan? This is, my name's Austin from Florida. I was recently uh, looking around on the Army's website, Army.mil, and I came across this document called the Civilian Inmate Labor Program. This was put on 2005, and I was just, like, reading over the first couple pages. Just in the first couple pages, this document on the Army's own website talks about converting military bases and installations into giant prisons and establishing civilian inmate labor programs. Have you ever heard of this? No. This is on army.mil if they yeah. want to look it okay. up. It's on another, another conspiracy theory. This is on the Army's website, yeah. sir. All right, so rather than to be in prison, right? They're going to have prison Well, I, I don't know, but, I mean, obviously there's a document that... Has a yeah, there are lots of documents in lots of places. But uh, this is on the military's own website. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Army.mil. Okay. I'm at army.mil. Um, it says the link's broken. There's no such army.mil. Can you get to army... I can't get to army.mil. Army Regulation 210-35. Now, this was set up in 1986 secretly. And for 10 plus years, it was secret. And in 1997, Bill Clinton declassified this, and we were the first major radio show to cover it. Since then, it's been expanded. This lists 12 camps 
to hold American citizens that have been built by the United States Army. And ladies and gentlemen, some of these facilities have U.S. citizens in them now. But it's all being done administratively. To beta test the Army running camps, they did deals with the federal government and now states to take prisoners convicted in the civilian courts and to then stick them on U.S. military bases administered by the Bureau of Prisons but operated by the U.S. Army. So see, they're taking state and federal prisoners and sticking them under Army control and building these civilian inmate labor camps all under Rex 84 right out in the open and no media will ever touch this. Beginning in October, the Army plans to station an active unit inside the United States. Under NORTHCOM and under the new Homeland Brigade, it was first going to be 3,000, and then 20,000, and then 40,000. The 3rd Infantry Division's 1st Brigade Combat Team has spent 35 of the last 60 months in Iraq. Combat hardened troops who've been running camps and centers in Iraq are now coming back to the United States to, quote, carry out law enforcement actions. The Army unit may be called upon to help with civil unrest and crowd control. There has been some concern and some misimpressions that, that I'd like to correct. Um, the primary purpose of this force is to provide help to people in need in the aftermath of a, a WMD-like event in the homeland. This force has got no role in uh, civil disturbance or civil unrest, any of those kinds of things. The Army Times reporting, quote, they may be called upon to help with civil unrest and crowd control or to deal with potentially horrific scenarios, end quote. NORTHCOM, the Northern Command uh, that came into being in October of 2002, uh, when that came in, people uh, like me were concerned that the Pentagon was going to use its forces here in the United States, and now it looks like, in fact, it is, even though on its website it says it doesn't have units of its own. Now it's getting a unit of its own. And the Army Times said during civil unrest inside the United States that the Army's new job would be engaging the American people. The Posse Comitatus Act of 1878 generally prohibits federal uniform services from carrying out domestic law enforcement duties, except in cases expressly authorized by the Constitution or an act of Congress. They can't just come in and say, you know, I want to see everything in your car. I want to see everything in your house. I want to go through your computer. You either have to voluntarily hand that over to them or they have to have probable cause and get a warrant to do that. So it's very clear that the government does not have the authority to be spying on us. That was not the intent of our founders when they created this system of government. Over the last decade, we've seen the introduction and enactment of some of the most dangerous legislation ever to be conceived by our elected officials, who have not forgotten who they serve, but only now reveal to the American people, through the fruit of their own actions, that our rights and our freedoms are secondary. The USA Patriot Act allows for American citizens to be picked up and incarcerated indefinitely without charges and allows law enforcement to conduct warrantless and secret searches of Americans' property and possessions. The Military Commissions Act dissolved the cornerstone of our Constitution by removing the writ of habeas corpus, allowing the permanent imprisonment of enemy combatants, and disallowing petitions to the court to know why you've been locked up in the first place. Although never passed by the Senate, the violent radicalization and Homegrown Terrorism Prevention Act shows us the mindset of our leaders in Washington. If passed into law, the bill would make public demonstrations 
and protesting into an act of terrorism and label the organizers as thought criminals and potential homegrown terrorists. Now that the federal government has the authority to sneak, snatch, and lock up its own citizens, a new bill has been introduced by Congress that gives the feds a place to hold those outspoken dissenters and potential domestic terrorists. The National Emergency Centers Establishment Act, or H.R. 645, allocates military bases to be converted into FEMA emergency centers. It also mandates that these camps be built complete with public works, medical, and educational facilities, just like the Japanese internment camps of the 1940s. Why is the media on one hand saying there are no FEMA camps, but on the other hand, legislation has been introduced to build them? H.R. 645, titled the National Emergency Centers Act, directs the Secretary of Homeland Security to establish national emergency centers throughout the United States. It's all being done for your own good. The bill directs these camps to be built in existing military installations, whether operational or not, for the stated purpose of providing temporary housing and to meet other appropriate needs as determined by the Secretary of Homeland Defense. Here's H.R. 645 legalizing what has already been developed, what's already been paid for by FEMA. And that is these FEMA camps for everybody's safety, these FEMA camps for everybody's comfort, these FEMA camps that the people need during emergencies. The government doesn't build things that are not needed or that there aren't contingency plans that say there's a reason for them. Also, it's been reported by a World Net Daily that the Department of Homeland Security has already awarded nearly a $400 million contract to Halliburton to t build some temporary detention centers on an as-needed basis. We know this is their main attack profile, is old, shut-down bases. And so you go point them out and go, look, the barbed wire's facing in, or look, you know, this is a designated FEMA camp. And they say, well, where are the people? Where are the people in the camp? The point is, it's a designated facility for that. Conceivably, these are the kinds of camps that could be used for political dissidents, uh, just like occurred in Nazi Germany. I got a feeling in the next few years that you may start to see uh, some American citizens end up in these camps for questioning the government. The president can declare a national emergency, and it can be anything. It can be a, a hurricane, or it can be political protests or civil disorders like we saw in the race riots. I think the government's anticipating that there's going to be a increased reaction against the economic downturn and this could lead mm -hmm. to the kinds of street riots and protests we've seen in countries such as France. If we do not have a government which is controlled and limited by the Constitution, then our personal motives and, and preferences are irrelevant. You know, it doesn't matter if you have freedom of speech if you're in a you know, FEMA concentration camp. It doesn't matter. You know, you're certainly not going to be allowed to have a gun inside a concentration camp and you know all of our rights are predicated on a a free america and if we don't have a free america all of the other questions become moot don't these companies have a responsibility morally if they're in their building camps and building shackles and building barbed wire facing in to speak out and say this is unconstitutional in the united states well of course they do but Kellogg, Brown & Root was connected to some of the contracting that went on at Camp X-Ray, Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. So this is their business. I talked to the Department of Homeland Security um, spokespeople, and they affirmed the contract with this KBR, the former Halliburton co company, was in place. The Department of Homeland Security was ready to build these contingency as needed detention centers anywhere in the country in the event of any kind of a national emergency, including natural disasters or again, riots or protests. Just because you think someone might commit a crime doesn't mean that they have done anything and does not mean that you have the right to punish them for what you think they are going to do. You know, in, in our system of government, you're supposed to be innocent until you are proven guilty, not guilty until you're proven innocent. And so if you can be declared guilty or potentially guilty before you even lift a finger, that is bordering on thought crime. That is bordering on, on punishing people for pre-crime.
I never understood these words before the thought police showed up at my front door. Liberty isn't something that we touch or feel or grasp in our hands. We can't taste it or smell it or hear it. It doesn't have a particular shape or size or color. It's intangible, elusive, and in constant need of nurturing, or else it withers and dies on the vines of tyranny. Modern tyranny is a lot more sophisticated than the Hitlerian or Stalin-esque things we've seen in the past. But even in Hitler's day, they knew how to sell it. And they advertised the camp says, hey, look, people don't like you here in the Warsaw Ghetto. You're not allowed to have jobs. You're not allowed to work. Get on the trains. We're coming to take you to a safer place where you're going to be able to work and be amongst your own people. They put them on trains, took them to the camps, killed the old and infirm, worked the other people to death. And they advertised, hey, we're going to be Laos you, going to give you a shower, march right in here. You have arrived at Sobibor. You are in eastern Poland. This is a labor camp. We have brought you here to work. You will work hard, but hard work is good for the soul. So in reality, we are your benefactors. You will be housed, you will be fed. All we ask is your cooperation. If you do your job, you will have nothing to fear. You will be given postcards. Write to your relatives, friends, to tell them that you have arrived here safely. We will mail them for you. Unfortunately, there have been reports that typhus has broken out at several labor camps. We do not want typhus at Sobibor. Therefore, first you will be taken to the shower facility, where you will each have a hot shower. Naturally, men and women will shower separately. Women will have their hair cut short before they shower. While you are showering, your clothing will be disinfected. Remember, the better your behavior, the easier your stay will be. As they roll this system out, this total federalization out, they're selling it as if the FEMA camp was a place that the disadvantaged and the poor and the illegal aliens as the economy collapses will need to come, will need to stay. Now in this more modern, sophisticated system, they're going to advertise the camps. They're going to show people getting the free concert, you know, uh, with a rock and roll star or the Sunday night movie and the free medical care. And they're going to be beating down the doors to get in the camps. Another way is, is to have an economic collapse that's fabricated. Okay, you just, you cut lending from banks. Nobody has any money anymore. The economy tanks. Okay, then you've got massive people homeless everywhere. Then there's a problem, economic collapse. The reaction is people get desperate and need a home. Solution is, ah, we pre present the home to you, which is the FEMA camp, which will be advertised as a wonderful place. Of course, it's a lie. So what you have there is they fabricate a problem to create reactions, which gives the solution they originally wanted in the beginning, which was to get everybody into the FEMA camps. That's our problem. This is the story of history. It's happened over and over and over. If you can detain people, I would call them quasi-concentration camps.
in 1999, American citizens were put in the Sandpoint Naval Brig outside of Seattle, Washington, and the news reported that FEMA was in control of the operation and was using the closed naval base as a mass prison. And the people were put in plastic handcuffs and taken indoors inside warehouse areas that had barbed wire fences, porta potties, and cots. The same system we saw set up at Pier 57 a few years later in 2004 for the Republican National Convention in New York City. Convention protest groups are not happy with what they call a clandestine detention center. We discovered officers that had to spray tear gas to control one protester and then at least four officers held down another protester. The recent discovery of a makeshift jail in Denver's warehouse district is causing outrage among some. It's a warehouse filled with makeshift jail centers to be used if there are mass arrests. It was apparently constructed to hold DNC protesters. Those cages are for the safety of law enforcement agents and those who are arrested, but Recreate 68 calls this place a concentration camp, unfit and inappropriate. We don't need another gulag or stalag or prison, whatever you want to call it, to house people who, are, who just want to express an opinion of a better world. That's why we have the protests. This lot sitting right next to where we're filming right now, it's fairly big, uh, comprising several acres. That itself can be readily turned into a holding area uh, by virtue of some Constantina wire, uh, some observation guard post, and a security ring. It doesn't take much. It can be a sports arena. Uh, it could be abandoned airports. It could be abandoned military facilities. Any place that you could set up a security perimeter could be used as a temporary internment camp. Well, it's, it's recording. We got a FEMA RV thing right over here. I don't think that's a thing. I think it's a security guard. Yeah, but why is a FEMA RV parked in Park front of the mall? In front of the mall? In front of the closed part of the mall? That's real weird. Dude, look, it says Department of Homeland Security. It's the Department of Homeland Security parked in front of the mall? In front of that closed part, though. Can you go? No, you can go in there. What kind of... Why do we need Homeland Security at the mall? I don't know. Do we, do we need Homeland Security right here? Look, it says it right there. That says... U.S. Department of Homeland Security. And why are they parked in front of the mall? Oh, man, that's what I want to know. What are y'all doing here? We were just, we just thought... I just want to know, I want to know what y'all are doing here. Step outside. Will you tell me what's going on? I will be more than happy as soon as you step outside. Sure. Is there a reason you're doing that? Uh, just, we just saw the FEMA thing. cam and I thought y'all were part of the, part of the there's some sort of emergency or what's going on? The mall had been shut down, or not the mall, this store had already been shut down, but. Is there some reason why FEMA's here or not? In case Ike hits. In case Ike? In case I what? Him, he's not Dude, the you're just a security guard, just, I, I'm yeah. a security guard. Yeah, we, we're, I'm sorry, we're part of a, a, an organization that is just making sure everybody understands what's going on these days. And I don't understand why why y'all are here, though. I still didn't explain why y'all are here. So what kind of operations are going on inside? Just tell me, what kind of operations are going on inside? They built the temporary uh, detention center. Uh, it was about 780 beds that have really made a difference uh, we still have a long road ahead of us, but FEMA's going to stick with us, and, and I know we'll make it. It's a $37 million facility. It was built in Indiana. It was modeled off of a uh, modern um, facility in Michigan. Um, it originally was designed in the States and brought down here in sections, so we put it together like one big Lego piece. Then people started noticing on the backs of uh, flatback rail cars these little one- and two-person mobile concrete jail cells. And those indeed have been manufactured by the tens of thousands and purchased uh, by the federal government and local governments. And they've been uh, stockpiling uh, on county, city, state, and federal land uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds uh, per site of these little mobile concrete uh, jail cells. Uh, so there certainly is a buildup uh, of that type of uh, equipment.
Several years ago, the military issued a challenge to create a faster and better razor tape. They wanted a barrier that would be at least 50 inches taller than the standard fence and one that could be deployed faster than 30 man hours. Ulster County-based Cobra Systems is getting ready to ship the first batch of its express razor wire to the U.S. military. The system allows soldiers to lay hundreds of yards of wire from the back of a vehicle in just a few moments. This is more of an action of a country that has gone absolutely berserk, that they feel that they would have to jail their own citizens, that the government would fear its own people so much that they would be talking about detaining people or incarcerating them or vetting them or investigating them or whatever. Uh, this whole thing has been turned on its head. So anytime that you can demonstrate the power of government and you want to condition people into a way of thinking or to intimidate them or make them fearful, uh, do actions that are going to put the fear of government and authority in people's hearts, strike that chord and make them shut up. Just when people in this country should be doing exactly the opposite because I don't even recognize this country anymore. Attention, attention, attention. American forces are here to help. Remain calm. We will not tolerate civil disobedience. Military Occupational Specialty, Internment Resettlement Specialist. This MOS plays an integral role in providing a uniform system of handling prisoners and detainees. Trained as Internment Resettlement Specialists to control and supervise detainees to ensure their humane treatment. For this job, the Army will train you to use specialized equipment to monitor activity, to conduct searches, and to inspect areas where prisoners work and live. Here, you'll train to in-process prisoners and detainees and to brief them on their rights. After your initial entry training and advanced individual training, you'll work long hours, day or night, in a garrison or field environment where you may practice emergency procedures, detect and confiscate contraband, and escort prisoners outside the facility. Military Occupational Specialty Internment Resettlement Specialist. The burden of service has fallen almost exclusively onto the backs of our military. And that's why I won't just ask for your vote as a candidate. I will ask for your service and your active citizenship when I'm President of the United States. Citizenship is not an entitlement program. It comes with responsibilities. A young person joining our military must know that we will only send them into harm's way when we absolutely must. We need to ease the burden on our troops while meeting the challenges of the 21st century. People of all ages, stations and skills will be asked to serve. Because when it comes to the challenges we face, the American people are not the problem, they are the answer. We cannot continue to rely only on our military in order to achieve the national security objectives that we've set. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong, just as well funded. Everybody somewhere between the ages of 18 and 25 will serve three months of basic training and understanding in a kind of civil defense. That universal sense of service, somewhere between ages 18 and 25, will give Americans, once again, a sense of what they are to be American and their contribution to a country and a common experience. We were taught, my brother and I, is that you have an obligation to give back. Now, that's why community service has been such a big part of my life. Our troops need to know that we're making the same commitment to this country that they've made. I love Obama. Spread hell.
gonna change it. Obama's gonna lead them. Since then, even the New York Times has reported that they're training the Boy Scouts now with Homeland Security to, quote, take on disgruntled veterans and gun owners in, quote, seek and destroy operations. And they had photos in the New York Times of these kids dressed up in Homeland Security outfits going after veterans and gun owners. Stalin said, give me somebody before at age seven, I can turn them into anything I want. So that's why there's this push, push, push. Get the kids into the school system. Get them to not follow evidence. Get them to only do as they're told. Get them to be little robots. Get them to think it's normal to march up in lines and act like little soldiers and so forth. And then later in life, they'll never know the difference. Everybody has to get, get rid of the idea that they're an individual. They have to understand that we all have to work in the group for the collective, for the good of the whole. Not for the good of your child or for the good of the teacher, for the good of the whole. If you have to give up some of your most cherished beliefs, and that they have to train you to give these up, because it's going to be for the good of the whole, you give it up. What this legislation does then is to help harness this patriotism and connect deeds to needs. We cannot continue to rely only on our military in order to achieve the national security objectives that we've set. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong, just as well-funded. They've been turning on the American people and working against our interests for a number of years. And the people that you may be seeing that are going to be targeted to be put into these camps, these dissidents, these disenfranchised, disaffected people, the government would never, never, ever turn on the American people. They would never create a situation where they were so displeased with their government that the government may be forced to throw these people in concentration camps. They'd never do that, would they? My name is Sam Ozaki. I'm a native-born American citizen, Los Angeles, California, along with about 120,000 other persons of Japanese ancestry when Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. We were all rounded up like cattle and placed into America's concentration camps. They had designated areas where people would report and they were transported by bus to their, they called them assembly centers. They didn't have facilities to house 120,000 persons, so they took over racetracks, fairgrounds, places like that. Work in the camp was slave labor. In fact, they had us making camouflage nets for the United States Army. Now that was absolutely slave labor. Later on, I said, we should all have refused to work and then let the Army and the government come in and do all the chores that had to be done. But as I said, we had lost all our, not only our life and liberty, but also our finances. You know, when you think about it later on, we were not much better than Hitler. On the other hand, we have to say that at least we were not gassed and murdered like the thousands that were killed, uh, millions really, in, uh, in Europe. Although I have to say that there were at least 10 persons shot and killed by American guards simply because they got too close to the barbed wire fence that was surrounding the camps. Native-born American citizens like myself were denied life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in total violation of all the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and so forth. Every morning the children would stand up, face the American flag, with liberty and justice for all. You know, it psychologically, it really affected us. That's why, for example, I mentioned earlier on that there were many parents who never even told their children that they had been in concentration camps because they were ashamed. We should not be ashamed. It was the United States government that should be totally ashamed of their behavior and putting 120,000 persons of Japanese ancestry in America's concentration camps and you have to be alert because it can happen again. We 
look at American history between 1942 and 1947, the data that was collected by the Census Bureau was handed over to the FBI and other organizations at the request of uh, President Roosevelt. And that's how the Japanese were rounded up and put into the internment camps. I'm not saying that that's what the administration is planning to do, but I am saying that private personal information that was given to the Census Bureau in the 1940s was used against Americans to round them up. I think there is a point when you say enough is enough to government intrusion. And you had mentioned this earlier, 28 pages. I have the survey right here, Glenn. This is the 28-page survey. This is the short form that every American will get next year. Do the, does the federal government really need to know our phone numbers? Do they really need to know, like you said, the date and time that we leave, mental stability? You know the one question that's not on this survey, Glenn? Are you a U.S. citizen? I am just not comfortable with the way this census is being handled, with associating with ACORN, with the questions that are being asked, with Americans being compelled to give this information. How will this be cross-checked? Will it be held privately? It's a five up to a $5,000 fine. They are saying that if somebody who is connected with ACORN, now working for the U.S. Census, shows up at your door, knocks on it, and demands to know your race, your employment status, the name of everybody in your household, whether you've ever received food stamps, and your phone number, and everybody else's phone number, and you say, I'm not really comfortable giving that to you, you're going to get fined 5000 bucks. The United States government, between 1942 and 1947, passed the Second War Powers Act. They used the U.S. Census information to round up the Japanese and put them in the internment camps. Okay. Americans were told that they wouldn't have their information used against them. They did. Well, one of the things that we're fighting here in Oklahoma City, we have a, a radio show called Radio Free Oklahoma, and we try to get the information out about the uh, upcoming swine flu vaccines. You hear that NORTHCOM is coordinating with FEMA to work for the mandatory vaccinations. There's all the, the legal uh, framework in place through the Patriot Acts and the uh, Emergency Medical Powers Act to, to force these uh, vaccines on people. And then if you deny it, you know, where are you going to go? Well, they say that you can be charged with a felony or put into a quarantine area. Now it's starting to come into view how these camps could be used. Well, today we're in a circumstance where the economic and the political dynamics are pushing America and the whole world into a crisis dynamic. This crisis is being created uh, through the process of sustainable development policy. Several things are, are, are occurring. One is that our system of justice is being changed. We're shifting from equal justice, where every human being has certain unalienable rights to life, liberty, and property, etc., to a system of social justice, where no one has any such right, but where people are judged based upon the group that they're part of. Previously, there have been several reports, such as the Mayak report in the state of Missouri, but this is the first time that a report such as this actually named individuals. Uh, once you label someone uh, in a derogatory manner, uh, an extremist, a potential militia member, terrorist, whatever term is used, uh, for some people the moniker will remain. Before you can persecute a people, before you can incarcerate large numbers of people, you have to marginalize them. Uh, you have to create the image uh, that these people are dangerous to society or they're extremists or radicals, call them what you will, but marginalize them from the mainstream of society so that at that point uh, the rest of society will accept the persecution that might result upon this group. It's been an age-old strategy that's worked in every totalitarian regime in the history of the world. And that's why we're concerned here in the United States when we see this kind of marginalization going on about people who voted for Ron Paul or people who voted for Chuck Baldwin. Uh, why are they being marginalized? Why uh, are they being singled out 
as a potential danger to society. And I think it's shades of the strategies and tactics of totalitarian regimes in history past, and that should never happen in this country. The people in Washington, D.C. haven't represented what was on the American people's minds for a long, long time. They are the most disassociated, discombobulated, disconnected people on this planet. And they necessarily had to do that for all the violations of the Constitution that they've done. Just how far are you willing to go before you stand up and say no more to the federal government? Our founders actually intended for the federal government to be very small and limited and that most of the uh, service of government was to be done in the states. And so I think there's probably a growing conflict between states and the federal government. And I think there's some really good reason for the federal government to be concerned right now because I think there are a lot of people in the United States that are beginning to say, where are we going to draw the line in the sand and say no more to the federal government? Every generation faces tyranny. Every generation faces corruption and is forced to stand up against it or become enslaved. Our ancestors fought and died so that we'd have the little bit of liberty we have now. It is a sacred treasure. And from liberty comes all prosperity. The human race is depending on all of you out there that are seeing this information to educate yourself on the facts presented in this film and then to take action. We've got to forget about Washington, D.C. I think Washington, D.C. is too far gone. It's a cesspool of iniquity. Uh, I think it's totally and thoroughly corrupt. It doesn't matter which party you put in charge of the White House or Congress. Nothing of substance changes. I really think the power and strength of the people rests where it always has rested, and that is with the states. So we need to start putting some teeth into our state laws and we need to be electing sheriffs that are going to protect us from federal agents when they initially don't understand this because their civics lessons weren't very good in school. The Tenth Amendment very clearly says any authority not granted to the federal government by the Constitution belongs to we the people and the sovereign states that make up this union. The states had all the power. They gave some few powers that are listed in the Constitution to the federal government and kept all the rest for themselves. Well, my first guest works for the people of Oklahoma and he's trying to do right by them. But he believes it's kind of hard to do that when the federal government keeps butting into the state's business. And now he's working to pass a bill in the state of Oklahoma that would declare state sovereignty from the federal government. Well, the resolution is saying that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land and that it specifically delegates certain powers to the federal government and all other powers are reserved to the people and the states and that the federal government has increasingly uh, moved out of that framework over the last several decades and that they need to get back into that proper role. A number of states already have them. Many more are considering similar resolutions as a bulwark, proponents say, against the federal government handing down laws that they see as unfunded or unconstitutional. Ongoing pattern of overstepping its constitutional authority. Dozens of states are now considering resolutions asserting their sovereignty under the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution, pushing back against Washington's intrusion into everything from land use to gun control. And there's really uh, somewhat of an uprising in the states across the country is this uh, federal law called the Real ID Act. Texas appears ready to declare its sovereignty again. A resolution doing just that has the unabashed endorsement of the state's governor. I believe the federal government has become oppressive. I believe it's become oppressive in its size, its intrusion in the lives of its citizens, and its interference with the affairs of our state. The bill, HCR 50, is currently in Texas's House. It reasserts the constitutional guarantee of the Tenth Amendment. We need to focus on our state government. We need to focus on our state legislators, the governor's mansion, the state Supreme Court, the sheriffs at the state and local level. All these, all these agencies uh, need to be the focus of freedom-loving people. And if you do treasure the notion that your rights 
are unalienable, meaning imbued in you by our Creator, and you want to defend the American circumstance, the only way we can effectively battle the Agenda 21 protocol is to do it locally. We have the checks and balances in the states to be able to maintain the freedom of our people. You get involved in your local area. I mean, that's where you can affect the most change. I don't know why we have FEMA. I don't see anything about a FEMA in our Constitution. I think it should be eliminated. We're fighting tyranny. We're standing up for liberty. We're the good guys. We have uh, the moral high ground on our side. All you have to do is get started. Take that first step, and then you'll find that, that you get this momentum, and it can't, you can't stop it. We are the government. Do whatever you can to get involved and get to know what is happening in your state. Are they watching people in your state and sending information up to FBI and Homeland Security? Are you going to be profiled in a report issued by your state? Just be alert. Study your Constitution, learn all you can. I think there's certain basic organic documents that you need to become familiar with. I would start with the Mayflower Compact. Uh, the next one I would urge you to read is Patrick Henry's famous speech where he ended by saying, give me liberty or give me death. Certainly the Declaration of Independence is one you really, it's a philosophical framework. Uh, the Constitution came along after that to be uh, actually the blueprint or the framework of a building built upon uh, the ideas uh, espoused in the Declaration of Independence. You must read the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers, Northwest Ordinance, George Washington's Farewell Address. These are the organic documents from which we came and it basically expressed who we were when we obtained the greatness it's who we need to go back to. On top of that, there are many other really important books to read to understand your enemy. And I would suggest The Shadows of Power by James Perloff, uh, Creature from Jekyll Island by uh, G. Edward Griffin. Uh, another one uh, actually written by one of the enemies, in my opinion, is uh, Carol Quigley's Tragedy and Hope. So read those, uh, those books, study and all to know what we are but also equip yourself with understanding of who your enemy is because we're in a struggle for our future at this point in time. I am now working at a network that will follow through on a story. I am not a journalist. I'm just a guy who cares. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm just a guy who cares an awful lot about my country. And I think you do too. But sometimes, for political reasons or whatever reasons, people just won't follow a story. I have to tell you, I'm doing a story tonight that I wanted to debunk these FEMA camps. I'm tired of hearing. You know about them? Sure. I'm tired of hearing. I wanted to debunk them. Well, we've now for several days done research on them. I can't debunk them. And we're going to carry the story tonight. I don't know anything about them. So. It is it is our government. If you trust our government, it's fine. If you have any kind of fear that we might be headed towards a totalitarian state, look out. I've been watching Glenn Beck for a long time, and I saw him say that Ron Paul supporters are basically all terrorists and that the army should watch Ron Paul supporters. Then he became Ron Paul's biggest buddy. I watched him uh, you know, come out repeatedly and demonize the 9-11 truth movement or anybody who questioned anything the government did. And then when he said he was going to expose the FEMA camps and he thought they were real, I said, look out folks, this is his MO. He acts like he's on our side. He acts like he's really investigating. And then he sucker punches you once he's gotten your confidence. Popular Mechanics, they did an incredible job in the writing of the definitive debunking of the 9-11 conspiracy that everybody knows now is not true because of Popular Mechanics except Rosie O'Donnell. James is here now to do the same with the FEMA camps. He specifically was going to build a straw man argument and go after some of the fake stories 
of uh, false FEMA camps like the Amtrak train station. This is an Amtrak repair facility in Beach Grove, Indiana. The, uh, the, the woman who made this video initially claims that it's some kind of American Auschwitz and they've outfitted buildings with gas and they've got these strange turnstiles. In fact, it's, uh, it is a repair facility. They're repairing trains in there. Well, trains, I believe Auschwitz had trains. I'm just saying, Jim. Oh, yes, there are real FEMA camps. and There are bills and legislation, and Americans have even been held in FEMA camps before during demonstrations in Seattle. But he didn't choose to go into any of that, even though we mailed him packets of that material. One of those buildings has been knocked down. This video actually dates from about 1995. So the turnstiles are there for, they, they were there. They're not there anymore? Right. The turnstiles were just ordinary subway turnstiles. It would be familiar to anyone who's ridden the subways in New York. He went to the disinfo on the internet knowing he could discredit a straw man. And that's what's so despicable about Glenn Beck is that his propaganda is so shoddy uh, that it's just amazingly predictable. By the way, if you want to get all of the information and more on the FEMA camps to debunk information that we couldn't get into this segment, help silence the annoying conspiracy freak in your life. There is enough out there. We don't need to make stuff up. Glenn Beck knows he's a liar.